Why are hospital prices fictional? Because it doesn't matter what year you're in, right now I'm in 2022, but you can do this in 2027, 2035, it doesn't matter. If you look up hospital price markup, you're going to find articles that sort of show how much hospitals mark up things like aspirin and hospital gowns and bags, where the article will be like, aspirin costs five cents in retail and the hospital is charging $2.50 for it. A gown, one of those paper gowns you use in the hospital costs $5 in retail and the hospital charges $40 for it. An IV bag, yeah, costs $10 and the hospital charges $80. You're going to find an article that's something like that. This kind of thing is fodder for the outrage industry. So anytime you look this up, you will find an article like this. Now, I'm an economist, I teach healthcare economics, and I would like to give you a few puzzling facts about hospital prices that tend to go along with these articles you see online, and then I would like to explain it using basic economics. The first puzzling fact is this one. It's the fact that the hospital charge master, which is just the list of prices that the hospital is sometimes required to publish by law, hospital charge master has huge markups. That's puzzle number one. Puzzle number two is that there's huge variation between hospitals in the price they're charging for surgery. And a lot of times you'll see articles where people will call up different hospitals and ask for a price of getting a hip replacement or whatever, and there's just like a crazy difference between hospitals where one will charge 10,000 and another will charge 120,000, and a lot of hospitals will actually answer that by saying, we don't know how much we charge, we can't give you a price. So both of these things happen. Um, hospitals just give hugely random prices, like really high prices, really low prices, and a lot of times hospitals will not give you a price. So we want to ask, what's the deal? How do we actually understand what's going on? And there's basically going to be two answers to this from an economist's standpoint. One has to do with fixed costs and variable costs, and the other has to do with the disconnect between supply and demand when we're talking about healthcare economics which I'll explain both of those in a second. But first I would like to do with you the exercise I do with my students when I teach this, because students read articles like this and they come to the class and I have to do this thing that shocks them because I love it when my students are shocked. Then they're like on the edge of their seats when I'm talking about fixed costs and variable costs, and that's just so great. So right after the students have encountered this kind of stuff, I have them think about hospital operating margin. And in particular, I have them guess what is the average hospital operating margin. So let's do that. Okay, operating margin is revenue minus expenses over revenue. So you can kind of think of this as what percent of the revenue is going to the hospital's pocket. It's a little bit like profit, it's not exactly profit, but it's, it's in that realm. So revenue minus expenses over revenue. And at this point, I show my students a list of average operating margins by industry. And you can look this up online. Here's one list of operating margins. This, of course, is going to change year to year, but this table gives you an idea of operating margin in different industries. At this point, I have my students guess. What do you think the average operating margin for hospitals is? And I also have them guess average operating margin for the pharmaceutical industry because of course we study both. So I would like you to come up with a number right now. Looking at this list, where would you place hospitals on this list? What do you think might be an average operating margin? Then, of course, I show them. This is the average operating margin for hospitals, which is usually way lower than students think it will be. And so at this point, this is a puzzle. On one hand, hospitals mark up their prices like crazy. On the other hand, their operating margin in hospitals isn't that high. So how do we make sense of this? 
And the first thing we need to think about to understand this is fixed costs versus variable costs. So once again, I came up with this table. What are some fixed costs that hospitals have? What are some variable costs? And what are some costs that are kind of ambiguous or, or that you can't really figure out? And I have the students come up with their own lists. I will do this now. Here are a few examples, and as I read through these, I would like you to think about which of these do you think is the biggest expense to a hospital, and which is the smallest expense. So for fixed costs, we have things like the equipment for the hospital, the building, the janitorial staff, the administration for the hospital. For variable costs, we have aspirin, gowns, IV bags, tests ordered, and you notice these are the sorts of things that are marked up in those outrage-inducing articles. And then for ambiguous costs, we have nursing time, time monitoring the patient, which could be done remotely through services that sort of um, capture all these things that beep and buzz while you're in the hospital. We have technicians who come by and uh, take different vital signs. Basically, the people who come in and out of your hospital room while you're in the hospital. Their salaries, their expenses. And you might ask, why are these ambiguous in terms of whether they're fixed or variable? And of course, um, the nursing time, you know, every new patient is going to need some extra nursing time. It's just very difficult to figure out how much of a specific nurse's time goes to an individual patient. Like you could, you could perhaps have like some app on the nurse's phone that sort of tracked which patient's room is she in at various points in time, how much time is she spending talking to the patient or he. Um, so th there could potentially be ways of measuring this, but it's kind of a chaotic measure and it will vary from patient to patient. Some patients are going to ask a lot of questions. Other patients are going to need a lot of uh, sort of complicated interactions with the nurses because those patients have a lot of, say, complicated home situations or complicated um, secondary illnesses that might make their hospital stay more, more difficult. So figuring out how much of the nurse's time goes to a single patient or how much of the nurse's time goes to a specific type of patient, such as a heart attack patient, that's actually fairly complicated. And you might imagine if you are a hospital administrator, if you're going to actually calculate um, how much time does the nurse spend with every type of patient to come up with an accurate price. For one, there's going to be huge variation in the cost of treating patients even of the same type. But for another, it's actually kind of expensive to monitor this stuff. Like you would have to have equipment that sort of tabulated the nurse's time in the room when the patient's there, the nurse's time in other spaces where the nurse is looking through charts and doing things that aren't directly to the patient. And so if you wanna come up with an actual number there that makes meaningful sense, that's going to be expensive. That's going to actually add to the cost of staying in the hospital. And in which case you could ask the question, is it worth the money to spend extra time trying to tabulate um, trying to tabulate how much of these costs are allocated to each specific patient. And of course that's an open question, I won't attempt to answer it here. But you can probably figure out, this is actually the majority of hospital expenses, or certainly these two things together, things that are not specific to the patient visit or not easily attributed to a patient visit, these are the majority of the expenses of going to the hospital. In which case you have to figure out a way of allocating these fixed costs and ambiguous costs to each patient or each type of patient. That's just difficult to do. So if hospital administrators are asked to come up with a charge master, to come up with a list of prices, 
They have random techniques for doing that, which are mostly fictional. I mean, obviously they know that if a patient's there for surgery, they're going to cost more than if they're there for a headache, but in general, um, the method that hospital administrators use to, to allocate these costs, allocate all of these fixed costs, have a lot of arbitrary elements to them. So that's the first reason that hospital prices are fictional. Now, what's the other reason? Now, the second reason hospital prices are fictional has to do with the weak connection between pricing and costs. And of course, part of the story here is the fact that hospitals are essentially mini monopolies or perhaps oligopolies where there's definitely strong barriers to entry into the field. And of course, we also acknowledge that hospitals have an inelastic demand for services, both because uh, hospital uh, services are completely necessary, you need them, um, you, you need them when you need them, um, but also because when people are making decisions about whether or not to purchase hospital services, they, they don't even see the price. That, the price isn't even part of their decision. So in some ways, this whole diagram isn't going to work as much. Um, now, we also acknowledge that for monopolies, there isn't as close a connection between costs and prices because prices are more determined by the demand curve. And monopolies that can jack up their prices will do so um, despite what costs are. So costs are going to be much more closely connected with prices in industries that are perfectly competitive or monopolistic competition industries. For monopoly industries, there is somewhat of a disconnect between uh, pricing and costs. So that's at play, of course. But we also want to think specifically about the two different types of hospital prices. One of them is the charge master, and the other is the negotiated prices that are negotiated between the hospital and the insurer. And of course, negotiated prices are really where real prices happen. The charge master is basically fictional. So how does the charge master happen? Um, usually the state government will require that hospitals publish prices. So they're like, okay, we have to publish this document uh, what principles should we use when we come up with these prices? And one way of thinking about what's going on there is that uh, the charge master is a starting bid for the negotiation between the uninsured and the hospital administrators. So basically, most patients are going to be insured, they're under negotiated prices, but for those who are not under negotiated prices, uh, how much do you charge them? And hospitals kind of know that they're not going to get all of the money from people who don't have insurance. Those people can't really afford normal prices. So they ask themselves, what price should we set to get the most we can out of patients who are uninsured? And they, they may set the charge master as a good starting point for that negotiation. That's one way of thinking about the charge master. Now, what about negotiated prices? Are those actually fictional? And those are slightly less fictional, but there is an element to them that is not well connected with the cost of production. For example, these prices are not negotiated individually. It's not like when the hospital and the insurer sit down at the negotiation table, they're like, what's the, what's the price for this surgery? What's the price for that surgery? What's the price for an overnight stay of this type of patient? They don't talk about every single possible case in the hospital. Rather, they come in with an entire list of prices and negotiations and reimbursement rates, and they negotiate over the entire list together. And because of that, you could imagine maybe the hospital is losing money on five different types of patients, but they're making a lot of money on 12 different types of patients. That's still a good deal for the hospital, even though those different parts of the list of prices that they're negotiating aren't, aren't really well connected with the actual patient costs in the hospital. So because everything is negotiated together in one big pool, the hospital knows that they're cross-subsidizing one type of patient with another type of patient. 
And cross-subsidization is basically the name of the game when it comes to hospital administration and negotiated prices. Now, you might ask, what are the different types of power that the insurer has versus the hospital? And the hospital has real bargaining power because if the hospital doesn't make enough money to survive, then the hospital is going to either go bankrupt or potentially just get rid of the types of services that are not lucrative. And you might imagine the hospital has, say, 12 different departments. One of them's labor and delivery, one of them is for heart disease, one of them is for um, ICU patients. There's different departments in the hospital. And every year, if, if the hospital loses money too many years in a row, they're going to have to be like, well, we can't do this forever. How do we make sure that we have non-zero profits this year? Well, they might get rid of the least lucrative department in their hospital. You see this all the time. You see hospitals that'll stop providing emergency room services, that will stop providing ICU services. Those hospitals say, we can't afford to do this anymore. Instead of actually providing these, we'll send those patients to different hospitals. And of course they do that because those entire departments or entire lines of services are are losing them money, are just bleeding the hospital money. So the possibility that the hospital could say, no, we're gonna get rid of that department, that's one source of negotiation power for the hospital at this negotiation table. But that means that there are a whole bunch of services that are all clustered together during this negotiation process. Some of the services cross-subsidize others. There's no minute discussion of each type of service. So essentially, even though negotiated prices are less fictional than the charge master, there's still a loose connection between negotiated prices and the actual cost of providing those services. This is just one of those problems in the healthcare industry, which is hard to get around. Now, you might ask, am I defending hospitals for these prices? And I mean, I think the answer is no. When it comes to these prices, what we want is services provided as efficiently as possible and to have a high quality of service and we want accountability for both of those things. Accountability for high quality, accountability for efficiency. And in normal markets, prices are one way of doing that. In a normal market with perfect information, that can happen in a way it cannot happen in the hospital industry.